really nice to see you guys. So just to try and sit in such a way that your back is straight up and down um, so that the energy system can flow really smoothly and it's easier to stay awake. So if you need to prop yourself or you need to brace in some way, um, go ahead and do that. And we'll shift gears to a different mind training text. So now we're going to shift to the eight verses and we're not going to do all of them. Um, just kind of let the words wash over you and see which ones sink in. And then if later you want to repeat this meditation, they'll be on the screen recorded. So the one that I'm going to focus on is down. And it's all about uh, troublemakers and offering the victory. So we're just going to explore some of those ideas once again. So reviving your motivation, bodhicitta, bodhicitta, bodhicitta. For all sentient beings, for all sentient beings, for all sentient beings. And we'll go back to the breath just for two or three minutes, just again to let the surface distraction settle. As you watch the breath, you can think that everything that came before is as if digesting or finding somewhere to live and settle within your mind. No added food or input is needed. Just processing what came before quietly in the background of your mind while in the forefront is just the breath. Just relax into the breath, spacious, not spacey.
and shift to analysis. Start by thinking of the verse five from Geshe Lungri Tampa. When out of envy, others mistreat me with abuse, insults or the like, I shall accept defeat and offer the victory to others. What does that mean for you today? Start with your own thoughts organically arising. What is it to offer the victory? What's the benefit of it? What's it for? Try and think a little bit deeply about what is it in someone or yourself when you want to win? Is there an element of wanting to take up space energetically or focused attention from others? Of wanting to be seen? And so when we offer the victory and we take ourselves out of competition, we're making room, we're making space. We're adjusting to accommodate those around us. Maybe if we're the one who won the literal victory, our party won, our team won, our family won, maybe offering the victory is then not rubbing it in, not gloating, not needing to dominate. When others are mistreating us with abuse, like harsh words and snide comments, like trying to take us for granted, like trying to overpower us in conversation, is there envy there? Is there something that we have that this abuser wants? Maybe they want our love and our compassion, but they have so much suffering, they're not expressing it in skillful ways. This verse is not to allow mistreatment or to endure, to encourage it to endure it. The invitation here is to take yourself out of the somebody needs to win and someone needs to lose. It's an offering where you become bigger than your own ego, bigger than the afflictions and suffering of someone else. So big you can hold the whole space unobtrusively, filling it with compassion so that everyone feels gently held without being constricted 
or dominated. So just explore what the mental atmosphere is when you're offering the victory to others. Explore the corners of this idea experientially. And some more thoughts to reflect on from Kensarin Vishay Geshe Teshi Sering. He says, it says here that I should accept defeat. What is the way of accepting defeat? So when someone is abusive toward you, how do you accept it? Geshe is saying here that someone is abusive, could be physically abusive. Someone is about to hit you and so forth. It doesn't mean that you have to sit there, all meek and small, and think I should see myself as the defeated one. I should just tolerate this. I should go through this. Is this the true way of practicing patience? Well, no, it's not. What this was meant by this is that you will not try to retaliate. If a person hits you, you should not be thinking about hitting back. If the person verbally abuses you, it doesn't mean you're going to respond with the same type of language and insult. So you accept defeat by not behaving in exactly the same manner. But does it mean you should not stop the beating, that you should not stop this abusive language? No. It means if that there is any way you can take away the stick, if you can hide the stick, if you can break the stick, you should do that. Practicing patience doesn't make you a doormat of someone else. You should not sit there meek and think you should tolerate. When it says accept defeat, it means you are not going to practice the same thing on the other person. So this idea that the practitioner of the great vehicle has to take on the defeat and accept whatever others throw, whatever abuse, physical, verbal, whatever, throw it on me and I will tolerate it and I will be quiet. This is not the person of the great vehicle. And you should not think that this is the practice of the great vehicle. And therefore think, I could never sit there and be beaten and abused and therefore I will not do this practice. Actually, you should employ every means possible so that you yourself are not harmed and the other person is not harmed. And that is not going to harm your practice of patience. It does not interfere with your patience. And so we can just think about those words. This is an inner attitude that doesn't need to retaliate. To accept defeat doesn't mean that you allow abuse. You know that abuse will hurt the person abusing in the long run, just as it hurts you in the immediate. Venerable Sable says, the more terrible things said to or about you, the stronger, more powerful weapons you have to destroy the ego, the delusions. 
This technique is the opposite of the self-cherishing thought and is a weapon to destroy it. You avoid negative karma, achieve a positive mind. This practice especially is the bodhisattva's practice. It is a special, extremely beneficial practice for the mind to cut life's problems because our main problem is wanting victory over others. The whole problem starts from there. This mind that says, me first, me first. His Holiness says, the point that is made here is that when others provoke you, perhaps for no reason or unjustly, instead of reacting in a negative way, as a true practitioner of altruism, you should be able to be tolerant toward them. You should remain unperturbed by such treatment. And so just allow yourself to explore the corners of that verse, the layers, when, out of envy, others mistreat me with abuse, insults, or the like, I shall accept defeat and offer the victory to others. And through the energy of these contemplations, may our patience grow and deepen, protecting our mind, protecting our body and speech from hurting others, as well as hurting ourselves. May this patience grow to such a degree that it goes without saying that you forgive others for their mistakes. It goes without saying, of course. And relaxing your attention. Okay, so that verse five is a, is a tricky one. Um, it's very easy for us to go too far with it in a way that's not skillful or to have so much resistance to it, we just kind of skip over it and go to the next verse. Um, what happened for you guys with that one? Did you have any little stuck spots or any new insights or light bulbs that you want to Make sure you keep for something and for some unknown reason i saw a lobster a live lobster and with its hands and i got the compassion for it that it was going to be put in a pot of boiling water and then i could feel of all the pain of 
all creatures, specifically lobster, I don't know why, but what we do to these things when life beings, when there's really no need for it. And then now when we went further on in the meditation, I was reminded of, well, Geshe Tashi was my refuge master. Oh, and I that's nice. Him saying at uh, one stage, something along the lines of, you, you know, we were complaining about why this happened, why this happened, you know, uh, how somebody did something to me. And he quite calmly said, well, that's what you were prayed for in your Bodhisattva vows. That's what you asked for. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. You wanted hardship and then you got hardship and said, I don't want hardship. That's right. And then <laughs> yeah. I was sort of thinking about, uh, yes, of um, it hasn't happened very often <laughs> that I can remember where somebody has been berating me. But then when I meditated on it, I thought, well, it's a fine line. I know how I am. You know, I'm right. I don't <laughs> with it. Then I thought, hey, you know, I'm being very self-cherishing here. Maybe I'm not all right. Maybe I need to listen to another perspective. Yeah, it's it's really interesting when, when you're in that really deep listening mode, even if you are the one that knows the most about something or other, when you're in a deep listening mode, it, it sort of frees up the creativity in the space and other people feel kind of more empowered to play with ideas and they feel kind of more safe like they can say the wrong thing or make mistakes and you're not going to jump on them and tell them that they're stupid you know it, it, it's really interesting when you don't feel like you need to insert yourself into a conversation even when you're the one that knows the most about whatever it is when you just kind of have that step back Let's yeah. let things play out and maybe add something occasionally, but more, you know, inviting questions, open questions, rather than kind of forcing beliefs. It's, it's mm -hmm. calming for you as an individual, but it's also really nice for the atmosphere of the group. Yeah. You know, that feeling. Yeah. Right. Could be really interesting. Yeah. Any, any other impressions from you guys from that one? Yeah, Teresa. <laughs> I had more of a, a physiological response with this second meditation and it was almost like my body was testing me. Okay, let's see how much, <laughs> let's see how much you've grown. So I would be sitting there and then I would get warm or I would have my eyes would water or my lips would get dry. Um, and just various things were just just poking at me and just, okay, let, let's, let's see if we can distract her with this, you know? Um, and, and I wasn't, I wasn't falling for it. I wasn't, okay, okay, all right, okay, notice, notice the dry mouth. Okay, notice the clenching in the jaw, just notice that tension and wonder where that's coming from. So just not getting, not getting caught up in it and lost in it. And is it okay to rub my eye when we're in the middle of a meditation? Um, so it, I didn't have that with the first practice. So this one, I had these little physiological quizzes coming at me. <laughs> that, that's interesting. Do you feel like it's that intellectually you're on board and you're like, yep, this is good stuff, I'm on board, but there's resistance in your mind that's a little bit unexamined. And so it's coming out in your body being like, itchy, itchy, mm. right. <laughs> you know, and sort of all sorts of physical stuff happening because there's like a subtle resistance in there. Do you, is it one of those, do you reckon? I'm not sure if it's a resistance or if it's a, if it's, a, a memory of something that's that's surfacing and oh here's an example and I don't have a I don't have a cognitive memory of it but I have a physiological response it may be a stress response um you know I'm not sure I, I'd want to I'd want to take more time to think about that but I I didn't I didn't get lost in in the distractions and I was, you know, they were, they were curious for me and there were a lot of them coming at me. It's, it's, it's rare to have, you know, I have something will, will come up, for example, getting warm. Um, that's, that's a common symptom. Like, okay. And I know that's going to subside in a few minutes. I'm going to get cold again. So just relax, just ride it out. 
Um, but to have so many symptoms in one 20 minute meditation is, is kind of, it's kind of funny actually, but uh, it was it was interesting to to observe all of the all of the shifts. Yeah, that it is really interesting. It also comes to mind that it could be a sign of purification. You know, sometimes when your mind is really focused in a virtuous, positive way, it almost kind of invites all sorts of um, you know, kind of old negative karma to ripen in a much milder form than it would normally, you know, so it's kind of like something that might have ripened as, you know, an excruciating headache was just yeah. kind of a weird tension, you know, or something that would have normally been like a, you know, cold hell or something. It just was the shivers for a minute. So sometimes when you have a really positive state of mind, you get weird obstacles, which are actually a good sign that your your head's in the right place. So there, that, that also came to mind as you were describing that. And sometimes in the Lam Rim, it describes odd dreams that seem like they would be inauspicious dreams, you know, like bathroom related dreams and things, but they're, which are actually a good sign that you have uh, purification happening. So there could be that too. Sometimes okay. when you're really centered and in the zone meditation wise, you'll also get weird stuff like that. It's so tricky because is it resistance or is it purification or is it both? You know, it's really something that you have to sit with yourself and kind of knowing myself, I'm thinking it's this <laughs> rather than just definitely it's one or the other, you know, it's got to come from the inside. But yeah, anyway, just more thoughts to explore. Yeah, so, Sabrina, did you want to add something? Oh, hi. Hey. <laughs> um, since you mentioned about headache, um, last, um, it was Saturday, right? We had a, a class and we had this meditation, the long, long time meditation. And that evening I have this really, really bad headache. Like I almost want to throw up because my head was just so dizzy. And, and I was just thinking, well, maybe it's because all the black smoke, I smoke, you know, <laughs> and I, I don't know, but hearing you say it just, um, it could be a, because um, my mind is in the right place. That's why I have that reaction sort of relieve me. Thank you. Good, good. Yeah, sometimes bad things are not a bad sign. Sometimes they're a good sign. You know, like in Numnays when you really struggle during the fasting retreat practice and some sort of like weird things will happen to your body that normally are not your body's problems. You know, normally you have painful hips but for some reason your knees are just going crazy but normally your knees are doing so well and you think knees you guys <laughs> you know and you're surprised at yourself that sometimes it's just stuff moving through maybe like a healing crisis you know it's it's worse before it gets better it's just you know be be the scientist of your own experience and ask yourself am i pushing my meditation too hard is it pushing more than my capacity Am I trying to digest concepts that are actually really confronting and they're bringing up lots of issues? Or am I like 100% on board? I love this. I'm in the zone. But now that I'm in the zone, it's kind of bringing up all this old stuff from the past and it's moving through and exhausting old negative karma. So it's almost like you have to stand back from your own experience and ask yourself, am I pushing? Is it good? Is it negative? You know, what's going on? And it takes a while to kind of get a sense of your own practice of what's exactly the right pace, you know, where you're pushing a little, but not with any kind of force, you know, you're just kind of gently nudging your mind slightly more positive than it was before, nudging yourself, cherishing out of the way a little bit more, you know, just kind of like making room for your heart to expand, but not in a way that's so abrupt or so harsh that you're going to have a backlash and hurt yourself. You know, and, um, and I know I've said it many times, but remember that your practice is very much like a funnel where you have, you know, a huge amount of knowledge and understanding intellectually, and then it takes a really long time for it to drip by drip by drip into your actual practice and realization. And that's totally fine and totally normal for there to be a huge gap between where you are intellectually and where you are emotionally or spiritually. 
it, the, the gap will close gradually. It's no, no problem. There's no fault in that. That's quite, it's to be expected, you know? <laughs> so yeah, gently. Thanks guys. Yeah. Um, did anyone else want to share about what came up with those couple of meditations? Good. Um, I was thinking the other night, maybe two nights ago, I had a weird dream of a movie I had seen, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you know, The Sound of Music, you guys have seen The Sound of Music, right? And I had a strange dream where it was that part in The Sound of Music where the whole family is hiding in the grave area, you know, with those gates, and they're hiding behind the gravestone, and the Nazis are coming and they're going to capture them. And so they're hiding. And then the Nazi that comes is Liesel's boyfriend, Rolf, right? And um, it looks like he's going to let them go. And then Captain Von Trapp says to him, you'll never be one of them. And that's what make Rolf yell, Lieutenant, Lieutenant, and then all the Nazis come and chase them, right? So for some reason, I had that, that scene in a dream. And I think it was related to what happened at the Capitol in the United States recently. And I think it's a little bit that fragile ego that that young Nazi boy had of he was almost ready to do the right thing, but it had to be his idea. And as soon as he was challenged a little bit, you know, you'll never be one of them, those bad Nazis that we're running from, it triggered his ego and he had to revert back to his more animal side and his more angry, afflicted side. This was the thinking that came to me. And then I was thinking about this verse about offering the victory. And what if in that moment, you know, of course it's pretend moment, even though it's a true story, but you know, what if in that moment, Captain Von Trapp had just said, thank you so much for protecting us, rather than needing to like, kind of nudge him a little bit about his stupid beliefs. You know, if he had offered the victory in that moment, would the Nazi have yelled? You know, it's, it's, it's just interesting, right? So anyway, those are the thoughts that are floating around in my head. But I think when we're looking at this verse, we have to ask ourselves, what creates the most conducive environment for people to be kind and for their best self to be invited out? Because everyone has Buddha nature and everyone has innate ignorance. Which side do we want to be talking to? You know, and which side are we then inviting out? You know, so when we need to win, you know, it sometimes feels like if someone is wrong and it's such a fundamental wrong that we must say something, otherwise we're a bad practitioner or a bad person. But if there's no opening or receptivity there, all we're doing is starting a conflict. You know, what if instead you thought this person has a really unhealthy, unsafe worldview? How do I help them feel safe with me? then maybe we can explore these ideas. You know, just like, anyway, so these are all just things to explore in our life, but with all of these verses, the main thing is come home to yourself first, come home to your heart of bodhicitta first. So at the very least, we're not adding to the anxiety and violence in the world with our energy, with our speech, with our actions, we're one less person engaged in that whole thing. You know, and by withdrawing from that kind of conflict, it, we all also kind of inviting peace around us. And that has a ripple effect and we can't underestimate that. So, so remember that this work you're doing really does have a positive impact. And um, we'll just stop and have a little short break like 10.